Today, I have the ultimate pleasure of introducing to you Mr. Gary Ryan Blair. Gary has written a book that I have recommended to absolutely everybody because I believe in my heart of hearts that this is the foundation to success. If you understand the principles in this book, whatever you learn going forward from this book will only amplify your success. And my goal as a career strategist with Law Strategically is to help you succeed in whatever that looks like for you. So without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Mr. Gary Ryan Blair, who is a best-selling author and he has inspired so many people with his programs and corporate programs and so on. So Gary, thank you for being here. Now, thank you so much. It's a delighted to be here with you. Thank you. Would you like to share with us a little bit about how you got to where you are today? <laughs> Don't we start this way? Yeah, let's go. Um, well, Cliff Notes, uh, grew up in Long Island. Um, classic dysfunctional middle-class family, probably not that much different from most of us. Um, I was fortunate enough, my dad was a hustler. He was, uh, he was an entrepreneur for the simple reason that he didn't have a, a, a deep education. I think he went about as far as seventh grade. But one thing my dad did, he was always in, uh, he was always in businesses that had to do with quarters, nickels, and dimes, car washes, vending machines, uh, anything, anything that basically related towards that, even telephone booths and stuff like that. Wow. But it, my dad said something was always kind of interesting. And uh, again, man with limited education, but he understand one foundational key that's always stood with me is that when we were sitting here eating dinner, he said, somebody's putting a quarter in one of our machines or using one of our, you know, uh, laundromats or using one of our car washes. And, uh, he said, you know, if you ever start a business, always have some type of a continuity type thing in mind. And as much as, you know, my education went much further beyond my father's. I went to school in Syracuse. I played football, you know, got a, an MBA and, and a number of things. But his, that lesson never, I've never lost sight of that. So every business I've been involved with, and there's been quite a few, there's always been some form of continuity built into it so that it, it's not that you're constantly out hunting every single day, is that you take care of the customer, you build a great service, and then it provides you with continuity income moving forward. There's a lot more to it, but that just gives you a quick thumbnail. Well, excellent. And well, how did you, you've written 52 principles in this book about how to live your life. And I would love to know, how did you come about putting those together and simplifying the message? Sure. You know, a, a lot of folks, if you pick that back up, let me show you so everybody can see, actually see the image on the front cover there. Okay. Now that exclamation mark means a lot, but let me give you the genesis of this. You can bring that right down right now. Um, Brian Tracy was a friend of mine and still is. We've known each other for a good 30 years at this point in time. And Brian obviously had spoken about this concept of everything counts. He never turned it into a book, never did anything about it. And it's always stood with me. So I want to give credit where credit is due. But I think I've, I've taken that concept and gone a, a number of miles more, which is, I know, is something that he's, he's quite delighted with as well. So, okay, first off, let's begin with the, the image on the front of that book. The, okay, it was very important for me. I'm a very big believer in the importance of, of symbology, of uh, symbols. Interesting. And just about everything that I do has some type of association towards some historical perspective or precedent. In this case, as it relates towards that exclamation mark, I look at that as a sign of excellence. So not too long ago, Gene Simmons actually got the trademark for a money bag from Kiss. So wow. he has it on hats and all over the place. He's done quite well with that. I'm actually in the process of attempting to get the exclamation mark uh, trademark. Wow. Now, the way to look at it is just this. There's three ways to end a sentence. You can end a sentence with a period, with a question mark, or an exclamation mark. The period, essentially 80% of all sentences end with a period. Right. A period, essentially, the best way to look at it, it's a workhorse. It's a blue collar, you know, symbol. It gets the job done. Nothing sexy about it, but it's predominant. It's average. Okay. The question mark, the original language for the question mark was basically called a, um, the interrogation mark. It was a point of interrogation. Why were you late? Why didn't you show up on time? You know, why didn't you do the job properly? Anything along that way. And it, it morphed itself into the question mark. No one ever wants to have a question mark. You don't want a question mark after your character, after your reputation, after your work, after anything that you do. Uh, but what you'll find is, is that there's a decent percentage of sentences that end with a question mark. 
for me, the exclamation mark was a mark, was a symbol of excellence. And that's the way that I looked at it. So that's the reason why I was on the cover of the book. I see. So henceforth, the subtitle of the book is 52 Remarkable Ways to, you know, to Empower Excellence. Okay. So my thinking was, how do you put an exclamation mark at the end of everything you do? For the simple reason that every single project, every phone call, every text message, every email, anything you send out has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I wasn't just interested with the ending with an exclamation mark. I was also interested with the beginning. How do you begin a presentation? How do you begin a phone call? How do you begin an interaction? How do you begin an email or anything along that way so that it stands out, so that it has you know, prominence? And that was the, the, the general idea. Now, that's the symbol. To relate towards everything counts. This is the beautiful part about it. Everything counts, essentially, it basically means this, is that everything that you do leads you towards or away from your goals. So I'll give you an example. I have a home in Florida and a home in New York, and I happen to be in New York right now. The road that connects these two is called Highway 95. 95, if anyone knows 95, it basically runs in two directions, runs in north and south, that's it. And it doesn't matter if you're in New York, if you're in Pennsylvania, if you find yourself through going through you know, Virginia or North Carolina or Georgia, you're either moving north or south on, on that road. So the thinking being is that this is the way people's lives are, is that you're either moving north in the direction of your goals or you're moving south away from them. But everything, every thought that you think, every action you engage in, every single thing that you do either takes you towards your goals, which is your North Star, or takes you away from it. And that's kind of the, the central core message of that book. But, you know, there's more to it than that, but I just figured to give you a little bit of an overview. I mean, what happened, the reason I just, this book spoke to me so strongly was because at one time I was in business was surrounded by people who didn't sweat the small stuff. And I was the one running around saying, but what about this? What about this? What about this? And I was sort of like, just be quiet and do your digital marketing. And when I read this book, I'm like, I know I'm not crazy. I know that everything does count. And you know, people that tell you, I'll call you tomorrow, and then they never do. And people that are flakes and don't follow through, it's always been an issue for me. And so this book just screamed to me about that finally somebody else is agreeing with me that everything really does count. And it just seems like the longer we go and the older I get, the more lax people are. It really is true. Well, you know, here's a, probably a good way to look at it. We live in a world where there's a lot of mixed messaging. People will say, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. But then on the other, the other time, they'll basically say the devil's in the details. And, you know, if I, I always tell folks, said, you know, just think about if you had a wedding, you had a wedding planner. Would you want a sloppy wedding planner? No, you want them to pay attention to detail. Would you want a sloppy attorney? Of course not. Would you want a sloppy surgeon? Every single cut, everything, everything touches. You couldn't go, and this is where you need to hold up excellence and elevate it. You couldn't go to somebody who is truly committed to excellence and say, don't sweat the small stuff. Every chef, again, every designer, any architect, they make their living. And what makes them preeminent and stand out is because they sweat the details. And this book really is a celebration of, of just that. If, if you want to live a life of excellence, you have to understand that there's certain non-negotiables. And, and I think it's a great overriding philosophy, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And I also know that you're also known as the goals guy because you have a wonderful course of challenge to help people achieve their goals. Would you mind sharing about that a little bit? Yeah, um, where the name came from, if you remember going back, this goes back a while, uh, Tim Allen, he had a show on TV called uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor. Oh yeah. Okay, well I say it because you know, might remember some of the younger folks who's listening may not. But uh, so at the time, I happened to be, you know, I was kind of formulating the, the concept for the business. And I knew I was going to focus it on strategy, strategy execution, if you will. And I wanted some type of a unique identifier. I just didn't want to use my name for two reasons. Um, number one, I knew that the, I, I wanted to create a brand name, if you will, that eventually I could sell. I could sell, I could give to my kids and do something. And it didn't necessarily just have to be associated with my name. So that was an important strategic decision. So the goals guy was kind of born. That's where that came from. It's, it's perhaps a little bit corny, but it's memorable. And I think at the end of the day, you know, you, you need something that people are going to remember. And from there, everything, you know, for the most part, it's been a pretty good ride for 20 plus years straight on up. And uh, I, I focused in on that niche. And I, I think I've done a pretty good job of, of exploiting that niche to the best of my ability. Outstanding. 
So why is it that people go and they take a seminar or they're all in on whatever it is they're gonna do and then somewhere along the line, it fades away? <laughs> There's a lot of answers to that question, but uh, yeah, it, happened quite, yeah, it happens quite a bit. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to look at it. You know, I was kind of talking about good habits, bad habits, and why do people do things and so forth. But let's go to the most extreme. Let's go to, let's go to, in all honesty, to a prison, to what's called recidivism rates. And recidivism rates essentially are why do people wind up going back to jail again and again and again? Oh, and I think you can expand that question and point it towards people and say, why do people repeat the same bad habits again and again and again and again? And the reason for it largely they will tell you that the reason why a prisoner winds up going back in prison, because once they get out of prison, they go back to the same environment. They go back to the same people. They go back to the same, you know, enticements. They go back to the same everything. Nothing changes. As a result of that, no matter how strong you are, there's a real good chance that your environment's going to go to work on you and you fall into the same pattern. When it comes to people's lives, people want to break habits. They want a new reality. They want to do things differently but they do it within the confines of the existing environment that's already caused the problems that they want to break out of. So until and unless they change their environment and manage their environment, they're, they're quite frankly going to have a recidivism rate. They're going to go fall back pretty quickly. And that's not to knock anybody, but that's just the reality of it. And if anyone who's gone through, whether it's you know AA or Gamblers Anonymous or anything along that way, they'll basically tell them, you need to really give some serious consideration to your environment. And, and I think that is a vastly underutilized or that's a conversation that, that many people need to have a, a much deeper and profound conversation about because your environment affects everything. Oh, that's that's massive. That's huge. And I understand you have children. So did you kind of raise them with the principles of this book? Yeah, yeah, much, much to the chagrin of the kids at times, but yeah. So, you know, we speak about it and, you know, it's, it's been part of the conversation and it's vastly different than the conversation that, you know, their, 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 their friends have had with, you know, and their own parents and stuff like that. But regardless, you know, I think you have to decide, you know, to me, when I, when we raised our kids and they were right now, the youngest one is 17. We didn't look at them as children. We looked at them as young adults. We looked at them as contributing members of society and, and what can we do to make sure that by the time they were 18, 19 years old, that they could stand on their own two feet, make decisions and make money and do a whole host of things. And in order to do that, you can't coddle them. You have to, you have to teach them fundamentally what life truly is all about. And for me, you know, self-reliance and self-sufficiency is perhaps the most important skill that it's the greatest gift that a, that a parent can give to their kids. Unfortunately, too many don't allow their kids to make mistakes, fall down, um, you know, get hurt a little bit or, you know, experience loss, but that's just part of life. Yeah, helicopter parents, right? That run, run back to school with the homework that they forgot and so on. Yeah, absolutely, I have very adult children. And um, I absolutely, I mean, if I was gonna raise kids again, honestly, I would tell every parent, you have to read this book and you have to instill these co concepts into a young person's mind so they get it. You know, the, the fact that you, you've got to be credible, you've got to be able to hold your own, you've got to be bold, you've got to be a lot of things, and you it's just too easy to put them in front of an iPad and watch a movie. Well, if, if you look at that book, um, here's the funny thing about it. I, I basically say that, um, you know, probably the best way to look at it is there's zero talent required to, to implement any of those things. And, and what I'm getting at here is, there's two sets of skills. There's hard skills and soft skills. And, and very often people say touchy feely and all this type of stuff. But at the end of the day, the DNA of a human being are, are soft skills. You know, it's decision, it's commitment, it's, you know, integrity, it's honor, it's follow through, it's work ethic. Um, it, it's, it's all of those things that are baked into that book. <coughs> Forgive me. Um, but it's a glorious, that book is a glorious celebration of the soft skills that kids need and any adult needs in order to produce hard, tangible results. But if you want to put food on the table, if you want to prosper, if you want to build a career of significance, it's going to be the, the, the culmination, if you will, uh, and the empowerment of all of those soft skills that are, that are built into that book, without a doubt. Absolutely. Um, I think we were chatting, you were saying something about the gut milk story. Yeah, well, it's, it's a kid's program that I'm working on. So, oh, um, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, here, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the core essence of it. 
for me, before I give a speech, before I create, you know, uh, I put out a newsletter or anything, and I put out a lot of content, everything begins with a question. So I always, I fundamentally come down to what's the core question that I want to answer in this, in this piece of content. And the question for, for this program called Got Goals is what are the 30 things that every young man or woman needs to master by the time they're 18 years of age? Well, so yeah. listen, anybody could argue, maybe they've got a different list, but that's fine. And it's my 30, they're built into it. So the program essentially that I'm working on and about to release is called Got Goals or Got Goals Challenge. Nice. And that will be a, 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 a the, the purpose of it is to create a world global community, if you will, of self-reliant young men and women. So this will be 30 skill sets that I'll take them through and they'll have a series of different challenges. You know, it's, it's so far beyond, you know, stuff like this ice bucket challenge and all this nonsense that you see out there. Right. This is real world stuff to teach them that you know, these are the type of things that the conversations that should be held around the dinner table, but unfortunately are not. Interesting. Can you give me an example of one challenge you might do? They decide the challenge or do you tell them what it is? Uh, you know, well, listen, I give them the, the general concept and then they have to apply it depending on what it really kind of comes down to. But it certainly it begins at the very beginning in terms of just understanding what a goal is. Um, <clears throat> and most are never taught taught this. It's kind of like even money. Most of have no idea how to make it, grow it, invest it and will it and everything else. So I begin the concept there. So this may be helpful. So my definition of a goal is that it's a glorious celebration of all that's good and virtuous about the human condition. And, and what I mean by that is when you look at somebody who wins with honor, that it begin, everything begins with decisiveness. Nothing happens until you make a decision. So decisiveness is a learned trait. And problem is, if you speak to most adults, not even put, put the kids aside, you ask people if they want to go to a movie or what they want for dinner or what they want on the menu, they can't make up their mind. So there's a big problem with decisiveness. So it begins there. So, you know, we teach them the importance of that, but, but let me walk you through kind of a great model. Great. I use a cookbook and in, inside the cookbook, I, I kind of break it down and basically say this is that there's five things in the cookbook that basically guarantee your success. I said, number one, it starts out with a beautiful four color picture. That picture represents exactly what the meal is going to look like 60, 90, you know, two hours from now. Right. The reason why the picture is important is that people need to understand how to visualize. They need to understand how to dream. And they need to realize that, you know, Walt Disney, before he finished that park, he had a very clear picture. An architect, before they build a building, they've got a clear picture as to where it's going to go. An interior designer who goes into that building has a beautiful way of taking of making something out of nothing. It's extraordinary, but your, your mind is, is, is an instrument you need to be able to visualize. So it begins there. So before I allow anyone to do anything, I, I want them to be able to visualize what that outcome is and describe it back to me. So that's what I do with, from a coaching standpoint. Okay, number one. Then you go through and you look at what are the other elements. So there are five. The, there's ingredients in there, but the ingredients are precise. It doesn't just say eggs, milk, butter, cheese. It basically tells you, you know, you need egg, big bowl, but it tells you two eggs, it tells you a stick of butter, it tells you this and that. So they're very, very precise. The reason why that's important is, you know, you can't just say, I want to, I want to lose weight or make more money. You want to know the exact number. Now, to tie that together, point number three is you start to look at it. There's a sequence. They'll tell you step one, step two, step three, step four. So if you follow that recipe, you start to start to kind of this turns into something. Let me stop there for just a moment. I'm a big believer in using perfection as the model for how you, how you determine things. And I think this, this, this is not a controversial subject. It's just one that most people don't look at it this way. So whenever I provide a strategy to my client, I want to make sure that absolutely positively these things will work 100% of the time or with a very high probability of success. My objective for my clients and what I build in every one of my programs is I want to fill them with the confidence of going to Vegas with four aces so that you can sit down at the table and know that what you're about to implement is going to work. So when you go, so to take that concept in mind, if you were to go to an ATM and you want to get your money out, your, your objective is to have, you want a result. You want your cash, your dineros in your hand. So to do that, you have to type in four numbers. I'm just curious, are they random or are they precise? Precise. You got it. Are they sequential or again, are they random? 
they're they're sequential. sequential. You got it. And if you do that, if you type in the four numbers in the proper sequence, if you do it 50, 100, 200, 2,000 times, what's the percentage that you will get your money out of your bank? 100%. You got it. Okay. So that's important. So wait till we have the next part. So we know that that strategy works 100% of the time. So we have a vision, we have a visual, we have precise instructions, we have them in a sequential order, like the cookbook is laid out. There's a measurement component, as I mentioned. So again, you measure everything as associated with it. And this is where that, you know, the two and the four and the, the how many ounces and everything else. The last part, part number five, is deadline. That for you and I is time and temperature. Right. Now, there's two types of deadlines. There's an internally enforced deadline and there's an externally enforced deadline. Most people realize this one too late in life. And this is what I teach the kids, what I want to get, afford, get across to them. So as an example, if you do not... If you do not learn discipline, you do not learn how to enforce this, you know, whatever the case might be, your employer or your parents will teach you about discipline until the day you finally wake up and realize it. it's kind of the way it's going to go. Discipline is either enforced internally by yourself or it's done externally by some party. Mm -hmm. Everything that we have in life, every obligation that we have is an externally enforced deadline. Your mortgage is an externally enforced deadline. The purpose of it is to get you to honor your obligations, to do what you said you were going to do. You have a car payment. It's an externally enforced deadline. You have an electric bill. You have a cell phone bill. You have everything. You have a life insurance payment. Everything is an externally enforced obligation that gets you to do what you said you were going to do. So deadlines have a built-in sense of accountability. Most people disrespect deadlines and they have a negative association with them. They're the greatest gift you will ever give yourself. So when you set your goals and you set them where one, you visualize the outcome, you do not begin until you see it. And then you make sure that you, everything basically follows that there's precise, that they are sequential, that there's a series, there's a, there's a plan, step one, two, three, and four, that there's a measurement component associated with it because what you inspect, you know, you, you, you're going to get in terms of what you measure grows. And then last is the deadline, which tells you when you expect to bring it across the finish line. So that's a long answer to a short question, but that's one of the components that's built into that. And it, it shows kids what they need to do in order to set a goal properly. And I think most people don't know how to do that. Oh, that's outstanding. I like that analogy a lot, a lot. Well, thank you. Well, if you had any advice that you would love to share with people just about life or success or whatever it is, what would that parting piece of advice be? Um, well, you know, I have, um, I choose my words carefully when it comes to, to that type of a question. I guess probably the most important one is this, is if you give me a few minutes, I'll elaborate on it, but, but we're all playing a high stakes game of one and done. That's it. That is not some type of a throwaway statement. You got one life in which to do everything you're ever going to do. And I need people to understand is, is that people will tell you throughout your life a whole series of things, most of them are wrong. One of them being is that life is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Well, I got news for you. You know, I'm in my late 50s at this point in time. And I can tell you, I can tell anyone who's listening right now, who's older or younger, especially anyone who's my age or older, are going to appreciate it and will nod their head in agreement. It goes by pretty darn fast. <laughs> and what, what you need to do, the most important thing you need to understand is, it is very important for you to learn some success habits early on in life so that you have a long-term long -term opportunity to experience the best things that life has to offer. There is nothing more tragic than seeing somebody in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who's undisciplined, unfocused, uncommitted, has no integrity, and who very, has very little checks on the, on the, uh, on the, on the scoreboard, if you will. It, yeah. it, it's sad, but it's true. And there's a lot, and the reason for it is because they never learned these things when they were eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, 18, and so forth. It's important, you have to realize is that, you know, you are, if you do not learn the, the proper skill sets in order to become successful at an early age, you will pay a very, very heavy price throughout the rest of your life. And stuff like discipline and focus and commitment and execution and all of these things, they're not throwaways, they're not cheap words, they're very important. They're the DNA of what constitutes a very, of a happy, successful life. So it's important that we master them. But let me give one other example, which may be helpful for this. Here's the way I set my goals. 
And this plays into the idea that we're playing a high stakes game of one and done. My life changed a number of years ago when I ran across a guy and I did meet him named Ross Perot. You may be familiar with Ross. Okay. What, where, where my business model really came in for the 100 day challenge and everything I do was, was how can you compress, you know, 10 years worth of work into 100 days? How can you compress 20 years worth of work into 20, in 200 days? Is it possible for you to do that? And the answer is unequivocally yes, but you need to understand you have to use the proper execution. So where does Ross Perot come in? I had read an article, and this was in Fortune magazine. It was basically that he was, he, he basically achieved his entire sales quota in the first week of January. Wow. And that, and that just stood out for me. They could sit, they wrote him up as the world's greatest salesperson and so on and so forth and everything else. And he was, he was a, he was a great salesman. And um, I remember that and I was thinking about it. My career was just kind of taking off. And I kept thinking, is it possible to really, you know, take that, take your annual income and turn it into a quarterly, turn it into a monthly, turn it into a weekly, and potentially turn it into, you know, a daily? Is it possible to do that? And I have found the answer. The answer is yes. I, I, I do launches, I do things, and I make more money, and usually on, on the first day of a launch, than most people make during the course of their entire lifetime. I, I figured that one out. Um, so I know it's possible to condense a lot of time into, into, into a very, very short window. Okay, here's the best way to look at it. We, you know, people talk about different terms like de de democracy. I want to talk about that and tie it together. The only thing that is truly democratic is time. That's it. You, I, anyone who's listening has the exact same amount of time. There is nothing else. Forget about equality and equity. And so bottom line is the only thing that has a, a, a universal sense of equality is time. Right. And over the course of a year, we have 525,600 minutes in a year. It's important. That number is non-negotiable. That's a rule without an exception. So if you want to make $525,600 this year, that means your time is worth $1 per minute. If you want to make a million dollars, that means your time is worth $1.92 per minute. If you want to make $50,000, that means your time is worth 25 cents per minute. That's the way it works. So you divide your... What I, what I want people to understand, especially as young as you are in life, is that it goes by quickly. And that your objective, ultimate objective, is to find ways to maximize your time. And you want to maximize it with your earning ability. Now, obviously, it, it, a lot of it has to do with what you invested, but also how you earn your money. But for me, you know, I'm in a situation as an entrepreneur where I could, I could truly maximize that. But the reason why you want to have a heightened sense of awareness of time, and you want to take last year's income and divide it into 525600 is because that gives you a full understanding of exactly what your time is worth. Because people say time is money, but they never figure, they never do the math. And you want to do that. So once you, once you figure out the number and you sit back and say to yourself, you want to do something, I want to make more money. What you have to do is realize this is where everything counts. This is where everything that we've spoken about comes together. Is that it, you have to make sure that every minute of your life has value. Because when you engage in procrastination, self-doubt, indecision, any of these things, they, they have a net negative impact on your life. There is no inherent positive value associated with those behaviors. So where everything counts comes in and ties it towards your income, you've got to realize that everything needs to be moving the needle in the direction of your goals and advancing your life in some way, shape, or form. And, and I think if people wake up and have a heightened awareness about the value of every single minute, that changes the choices they make, the people they spend that time with, uh, and, and the things that they're doing. And, and I'm not just saying that there's no time for leisure or stuff like that. There is. But you have to realize that there are certain behaviors that are going to improve the quality of your life and certain ones that are going to rob you and take it away. And you certainly want to focus it on the, you want to focus it on the winners, if you will. Absolutely. And, you know, so often people think that we're just talking, like you said, about your financial goals. But in reality, you only have so much time with your kids, too. They're only going to be a certain age for a certain amount of time. And then it's over. Well, the, the way to look at that as well is look at it, look at a circle for a moment. That's a 24 hour clock. You know, people are mistaken because they talk about they want to have quality time with their kids, but they don't understand what that means. So I'll give you a quick maybe minute or two on it. If you look at that circle and you start to cut it and slice it, you realize an average person is going to sleep about maybe seven, eight hours. OK, so you're already you've got a third of your days gone. Then some people are going to commute. So let's add an hour on there, back and forth, whatever it is, okay, nine. 
Then you've got some people who are going to want to eat lunch. So you add another little bit of time there. You know, then you start to look at, well, maybe they want to, they've got to go, you know, not just to, to uh, you know, eight hours of sleeping. Now you've got work, which could be eight to 10 hours for other people. If you do the math, that's 18, 19 hours already in a 24 hour day. Then they go home and they basically have about four or five hours left with which to raise or spend time with their kids. But there's a good chance the kids are going to be asleep or have other activities. Right. So you have a very small window of time on a daily basis if you're a working professional to spend with your kids. So now you have to sit back and say to yourself, there is no such thing as a balance and equal balance or distribution of time. It doesn't exist. But what you do have is you have focus. So what that means is focus means follow one course until successful. So if you're with your kids and you only have 20 minutes or 30 minutes, put the phone down, Right. put the rest of your life away and spend that 30 or 45 minutes and give them 100% of your attention. And that's what, what I mean by follow one course until successful. And that, that goes with just about anything. We need to learn how to compartmentalize and turn things on and turn things off. And again, I think it's a skill set that very few of us have figured out how to master. Well, that's outstanding. I love that. Thank you. Well, very good. Well, Gary, if people want to reach out to you and get in contact with you, what would you like them to do? Sure. Hey, listen, the easiest way, just go to 100-100-100 daychallenge.com. And, you know, you get a lot of information on me. You can find out probably about one of the greatest programs that's ever been put together uh, as to, you know, helping people to accelerate and fast track their goals. That's a good place to start. You can find my email and everything else there on that site. Excellent. And then, of course, I can find your books on Amazon. You've got quite a few on there. <laughs> yeah, just go to Amazon, type in Gary Ryan Blair, type in Everything Counts, and you'll find it pretty quick. Boom, there it is. Absolutely. Well, Gary, I, I can't even tell you how grateful I am to speak to you today. I uh, truly just think that what you have given to the world with your knowledge and the way you express yourself verbally in your audios and so on, you're unmatched. And I just really hope that people will take advantage of knowing who you are and following some of your advice. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Well, stay well and we'll talk again soon. You the same. Thank you.